And, and what was he working at at the time? Dude, this is a funny story. He was, um, so in a communist country, everybody works for the government, right? Right. And so he worked in a men's suit manufacturing plant. So he was a tailor, one of probably hundreds of tailors in this mm -hmm. giant plant. But he was, had a supervisor role. Mm -hmm. And as a supervisor, his job was to, you know, make sure that all the tailors and seamstresses had enough material to make the suits, the jackets, the vests, the pants. Right. Well, he had figured out in all those jacket suits and pants, now I'm gonna give you a little lesson on, <clears throat> on alterations, but mm -hmm. it all starts off with putting patterns on giant pieces of material and then mm -hmm. cutting around the patterns. My dad had figured out that for every 11 patterns, if he put them together really tightly, mm -hmm. he could save enough material up for one suit mm -hmm. that would be off the record, gotcha. right? Yeah, off the books. <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. He would take that material home, make a custom suit for actually a lot of his underground customers were KGB agents. He would sell them the suits off the record for a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was how he accumulated the money mm -hmm. to bribe the government into letting us escape the Soviet Union and come to the United States. Wow. Right? W which taught you a lesson, I'm sure, to be a hustler, to be able to think outside oh the box, God. right? Yeah. Way, I mean, if that's not being resourceful and thinking outside of the box, mm -hmm. I don't know what is. And What's crazy is many of those lessons kept coming once we came to this country. Because again, you're poor, you're broke, you don't speak English, you don't understand the culture, family of five living in a one bedroom apartment. Wow. And um, all we had was a, and, and the only reason we had that one bedroom was a friend of a friend allowed us to stay in this guy's one bedroom apartment for one month. And he goes, after a month, you guys have to go. Right. So everyone, all the, all the adults had to work. Mm -hmm. Like they were delivering newspapers, washing dishes at a pizzeria, pumping gas, and my mom raised me the best she could. Now, all the money had to be saved to get, to get us an apartment. Yeah. So in the very first month, my dad discovered that these grocery stores have dumpsters that they throw food in. Mm. Because food expires, right? right? It's perishable, yeah. It's perishable, and so he, he would put me into the dumpsters and I'd fish out, I remember fishing <laughs> out cheese and bread and gallons of milk, yeah. and it's expired, but it hasn't necessarily gone bad. Right. He can't, they can't sell it, but we can still consume it. Right. And so I was a breadwinner in the family. Literally. <laughs> literally, because the money had to go towards saving it up for getting our own place, right? Getting our own apartment. And of course, at that time, that didn't seem weird to you. That just seemed normal, right? That's just what me and dad do kind of That's thing. it. When mom and dad, you know, people ask me all the time, they go, hey man, so when you're escaping a country, like in hindsight, I look back, they go, were you scared? In hindsight, I look back and I realize, man, there was fear in my mom and dad's eyes. Mm. You know, we went from, the Soviet Union from, from Armenia to Moscow, to mm -hmm. Moscow to Italy, Italy to JFK, New York, yeah. New York to California, our final destination. And the only reason my dad chose California is he heard that there's no snow. <laughs> Soviet Union, there's a lot of snow. He was tired of the cold. Wow. <clears throat> How old so, was he at this time? 46. And despite having like limited financial means, being pretty broke, not being able to afford food, he still managed to save 25 grand to come to this country. So this was like a priority for his family that he Massive sacrificed. Priority. Wow. Oh, dude, if he had gotten caught yeah. escaping into the enemy's country, yeah. like he wasn't just going to a sympathizing country like Italy. Yeah. We went into Italy because it was easier, right? right? From Italy, we went to the United States. Like if he had got, gotten caught, it's immediately killed, not even like prison. Wow. It's just you're killed, that's yeah. it. And so he was, but to him, staying there would have been the death of him. A slow death, so a to speak. A slow death, yeah, yeah, even yeah. worse, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. And so I learned how to be resourceful by digging in dumpsters. I learned how to be resourceful when I saw my dad siphon out gasoline from a parked car for my wow. mom because we, I got lice in one of the crap hole apartments. We, we lived in Section 8 housing in Santa Ana and um, I, I got lice so bad. I was like, I had scabs on my head. My mom's like, what the hell's going on with this kid? Right. She sees I've got lice. Well, we couldn't afford life treatment. Again, like every penny counts. Right. And the hell if they're going to buy life treatment for me. So this is a recurring theme as you're going up. We don't have money. Be resourceful. Be resourceful. Yeah. 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 And you talk about building a, a screwed up mind money connection. Right. Yeah. Right. Like my relationship with money was completely twisted. Like we weren't even blue collar. We were just like homeless collar if mm -hmm. there was ever, ever such thing. So dreams of millions or anything like that, not even remotely on the radar. Yeah. No. The, the thing that I would hear was we keep running out of money before we run out of month. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've got lice and my mom's trying to find another solution other than buying lice treatment. Mm -hmm. So she makes my dad siphon out gasoline from a parked car and she uses two cups of siphoned out gasoline to wash my hair to kill the lice. Wow. And so once again, I see that when you don't have the resources, you have to hustle, grind and get resourceful. Mm -hmm. 
the biggest entrepreneurial lesson that I learned as a six-year-old child growing up in this country was saying that you don't have the resources is unacceptable. Right. There's always an opportunity to be resourceful. Mm -hmm. If you're committed. Yeah, if you're committed. And the irony of that is I got a uh, Instagram DM probably about two months ago mm -hmm. from a young man who says, I've got this great idea for a follow along workout that mm -hmm. I want to do and sell to people, right? A digital information product. Right. I said, great, let's do this, do it. He goes, but I don't have money to get a web designer. I don't have money to buy traffic from Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. I don't have money to create um, the product and I, and I don't have a way of buying, getting the shopping cart, mm -hmm. authorized.net, Stripe, et cetera. Right. My response to him was, there's WordPress, so you can make a free website. Mm -hmm. You probably have an iPhone, which is how you're contacting me through the social media platform. Right. If you have an iPhone, you can shoot the videos yourself. Mm -hmm. You can market for free. You don't have to market with, with money right now mm -hmm. if you don't have it. And so you can market on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. You can use PayPal and accept money for free. Mm -hmm. So he kept telling me all the reasons why he can't. Right. All I saw was opportunities and why he could. Mm. Resourcefulness. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think... A lot of people listening to this who might not only be entrepreneurs or maybe aspiring or maybe look up to you, they might see, well, you know, he, he sort of had it together. Maybe he already had money or he had capital or maybe they don't know the story. Um, but could you talk a little bit about how important it is to actually be resourceful, to actually know, like, to use what you do have to your advantage? Because I think it's a recurring theme that a lot of people that ended up becoming successful in their own niche, so to speak, they started out with a minimum viable product, so to speak, right? Yep. A shitty website, a shitty funnel, but at least it gets them in go mode. Yes. It gets right, it gets the ball rolling instead of waiting for when I have the money to launch perfectly. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Truth about the matter is that perfect doesn't exist, right? Mm. In our mind's eye, we all have the perfect idea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create this franchise, and people are going to sign up, and we're going to get franchises all over the world. Little, I, little did I know in the process that the great state of California was going to attempt to find me $2,500 per location at the time we had 187 location. Wow. Because I didn't start it off as a franchise, I started off as a licensing program, mm -hmm. right? So my perfect vision was, I'm gonna create this franchise, mm -hmm. people are gonna buy it, and then people are gonna sign up all over the world and use it. And I'm gonna be the world's best fitness person, right? <laughs> Simple as that, right? Because yeah, my <laughs> only goal as a fat kid growing up in this country, because I had so much processed and junk food, mm -hmm. was that I just wanna help, once I lost the weight and got fit, I wanted to help more people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fitness was my path. I knew that I was a personal trainer, then I started coaching and consulting personal trainers, and I created the franchise. Mm -hmm. Well, the perfect plan was to build it, sell it, service the people. Well. As it turns out, because I wasn't a franchise yet, but I was operating like one, mm -hmm. I didn't even know the difference, right. quite honestly. The state of California says, hey, you've been operating like a franchise, but you're not officially a franchise. We're gonna fine you $2,500 per location. Wow. We have 187 locations. That might as well, well have been $25 million per location, Omar, right. because I didn't have that kind of money. Right. It's almost half a million dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right? And so there's a great opportunity there to, again, to go resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. Do I go, all right, do I just give up? Or do I go, hey, person who reached out to me, do you have a supervisor? Do you have a super I literally called up the food <laughs> chain in the great state of California until I said, look, told them my story, mm -hmm. like why I started the franchise. I'm not some highfalutin entrepreneur. I started the franchise because I was a fat kid. I came to this country from a foreign country. I've eaten out of dumpsters and I, and, and I, I had low self-esteem, low self-image, low self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And I just want to help more people through my franchise. And if you find me $2,500 per location, I won't be able to pay you. It'll be easier for me just to fold. And there's 187 locations that rely on me for their marketing information. Right. And employees. And, and yeah, employees exactly. are going to go to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. Or I can apologize and I will promise not to sell another location until I become a franchise. Mm -hmm. So I became resourceful and I realized someone there in the great state of California is a human, right. and humans have emotions. Mm -hmm. And when you tell a human a story mm -hmm. with emotions woven in, see if I just gave them facts, I didn't know, talk to my lawyer, blah, 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 mm -hmm. they would have stuck it to me, dude. Right. But I'm a human, you're a human, let me just tell you, and they said, you know what, all right, you don't have to pay the fine, mm -hmm. but you can't sell another location until you officially become a franchise. Mm -hmm. So in 2012, we officially became a franchise after 11 months of not selling a single location. Wow. It hurt to not sell a single location, for sure. but I'll take that option over the alternative. Right, full. And so again, it's about being resourceful and going, who can I talk to? Are they a human? Do they have feelings? Do they have emotions? Do they have thoughts? Maybe they have a few pounds to lose. They can understand my plight, mm -hmm. right? But so many people give up the moment a hurdle is put in front of them. And I've heard this quote that says, the road to success is riddled with bumps and potholes and detours. Mm -hmm. 
And it's so true because in a perfect world, I just wanted to build a franchise and then have thousands of locations. And have it be linear growth. Yes. yes. But man, it was spiking up and down <laughs> like a heart patient, you know? Yeah. So let's go back.